that. So uh, I promise to give you two lectures on uh, informationally robust uh, mechanism design. Uh, I'm going to do that in two parts. Um, for the first lecture, I'm going to talk about um, informational robustness and solution concepts. Let me, let me explain why. Okay, so informational robustness, um, just the idea that we don't know a lot about the information that economic agents have. Uh, so we'd like to do economic analysis that is not too sensitive to that. Uh, it turns out that thinking about informational robustness uh, is going to, uh, you know, many different ways of trying to think about informational robustness are going to end up being equivalent to thinking about uh, something about uh, uh, solution concepts in game theory. Okay? That, uh, to, to say that something is informationally robust is to um, say that it survives under a, um, a more uh, permissive solution concept. Um, but I don't want to just um, assert that. <coughs> I want to give um, formal foundations um, for why that's the case. Uh, so what I'm going to do is in this lecture, uh, I will uh, discuss uh, that connection uh, sort of uh, abstractly, or, or certainly abstracting from the mechanism design aspects. Okay? In my next lecture, um, and in fact also the lectures that Ben Brooks gave earlier, um, will use this connection between informational robustness and uh, solution concepts to do stuff in mechanism design, which, after all, is the topic of the conference. Okay? So, in fact, my, my next lecture is going to be basically uh, coming full circle to the full implementation results that um, Eric told you about uh, uh, in the first uh, lecture here in the summer school, um, and, um, but analyze them um, from uh, what I'm calling this informationally robust perspective. Okay? But we're going to segue um, directly from the material that I'm talking about today that doesn't mention mechanism design. We're going to segue directly into this full implementation stuff using stuff that we've developed today. Okay? So it seems like I, I was quite pleased with this logical structure of explaining things. We kind of separate things out, uh, hopefully make things a little clearer. There is a downside to this um, uh, way of presenting it, though, which is that today's lecture is going to be a, a tiny bit taxonomic. Okay, I'm going to be telling you a bunch of results about the connection between solution concepts and uh, informational robustness, a, uh, a menu of results, if you like. Um, uh, so yeah, that's it. You've got to invest in that in order to get on to the other stuff. Uh, however, I think it's kind of of independent interest. I'm actually going to uh, spend a little time on some um, extremely classic work on solution concepts and foundations of solution concepts of in, in game theory. Uh, I'm going to do that for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, everybody should know it, and maybe people don't. It's not as... Uh, uh, it's not as, you know, let's say I'm going to be talking about stuff that <coughs> goes back 30 years and it's stuff that was pretty uh, central when I was being taught game theory, let's say, 20 years ago, a little more than 20 years. Um, and um, uh, so for those of you who don't know it, you should know it. And a second reason for doing the foundational stuff is because once I've um, told you that or reminded you of that, depending on... Um, it's going to be the case that all the rest of the um, sort of taxonom taxonomical stuff that I told you about, uh, I'm going to be able to talk you through, uh, mostly in words, um, because the arguments are just extensions of these classic results. Okay? So if I've told you or reminded you of these classic results, it's going to be, the idea is, is it's going to be very easy to go relatively quickly through a bunch of stuff, this taxonomy-like business, that is going to be important. Okay, so that's where we're going. Okay, so uh, what do I mean by going back to basics? Well, I'm going to tell you something about solution concepts for complete information games that I'm going to be building on, okay, and, and extending to uh, incomplete information. Okay, so complete information game, we have n players. There's a game. The game is going to consist uh, uh, for each player i uh, of a finite set of actions and utility functions. 
Okay, I'll, I'll keep using this notation that whenever you see I have subscripted actions for each player, and I'll be looking at the, I'll write capital A for the product set, and I'll keep doing that for all kinds of variables. Okay, so that's a complete information game. I am going to assume that you're familiar with Nash equilibria, so uh, let's talk about correlated equilibria. Okay, so correlated equilibrium is an idea suggested by, by Bob Auman, and a m mechanical definition uh, is this one. He said a correlated equilibrium of that complete information game uh, is a joint distribution over actions, so a probability distribution over actions, uh, such that if a player only knew the action that he was supposed to be playing under that uh, probability distribution, he would have no incentive to do something different. Okay, so the classical uh, language that we sometimes use to describe a correlated equilibrium is you could think of there being a mediator who uh, draws an action profile according to this probability distribution. He whispers in the ear of each player what action should he take, and you know it's a correlated equilibrium if the player would want to take the action that's recommended to him. Okay, that's what this says. We're using sigma of a minus i given a to be the, the updated, the Bayes updated posterior belief about a minus i that you would have conditional on ai. So this term on the top is taking an expectation with respect to other players' actions. That's what you would get if you simply followed the mediator's recommendation to play ai. Okay, you might deviate and decide that you're going to play ai prime instead, but you would not want to do so, is what this uh, condition says. Okay. So, so that's correlated equilibrium. I gave you this um, uh, uh, mediator interpretation of it. We don't think that there's really a mediator. That's kind of a metaphor to understand the definition. Uh, we'll come back to why you might want to study it in a second. Okay, here's another classical solution concept is rationalizability. Okay, uh, and the version of rationalizability that I'm going to be talking about um, is the idea that we're going to be looking at behavior, but if you're playing a game and we iteratively delete actions that are never best responses in that game, uh, what do you get at the end? Okay. Um, I put here uh, correlated rationalizability because when I say we're going to iteratively delete actions which are never best responses, I'm going to allow you to have a conjecture about the actions of other players or the action profiles of other players um, that, that are correlated. Okay, the original definition of rationalizability, uh, Bernheim and Pierce, did not allow them to be correlated. I'm going to just, all the way through the talk, in my extensions, talk about rationalizability. Correlation is always good. Okay, um, okay so formally, uh, we can do an iterative construction of rationalizable actions. We could start out and say that all actions are zeroth level rationalizable. That's what we're saying here. Right. R subscript I superscript O for the zeroth level rationalizable actions of player I. At each round, we're going to inductively define kth level rationalizable actions. So Ri k plus 1 is the set of actions that has the property that, f you know, an action is included in this set if it's the case that for that action there exists a probability distribution over the actions of others, the action profiles of others that haven't been deleted, such that this action AI uh, is a best response to that conjecture. So it's an argmax of the expected utility that you get under that conjecture. Okay, so this notation is the product set. It's saying the product of the RK, K for K, subscript J, J for player J, we're looking at the product set of all surviving action profiles of the other players. Okay, so that's rationalizability. Uh, we keep doing that deletion. Maybe I didn't say it. We're assuming finite actions here. So this iterated deletion is going to terminate, and we're going to get a set of actions that are rationalizable for player A. What is the relation of the relationship to other We're going to do that, I guess. Yeah, we're going to exactly do that. That's the point. All right. Uh, well, I said that we were going to talk about informational robustness. Okay, what do we happen if we don't know uh, exactly what information is floating around? 
Okay. Um, well, here's a way of thinking about uh, you know a special uh, uh, restrictive uh, little informational robustness exercise, which is that we could say um, let's just add information to this original complete information game. Uh, let's complete information so they kind of know everything in the first place. So there's only so much information that you can add. What you can add is a correlation device. Okay, so that it's a sort of extra information. Pay off irrelevant information I've written here, but that's like adding something to the game. Okay? So let's call it an expansion of the game. We're adding stuff to the game. We're going to specify for each player I some new stuff. What's that stuff going to be? Well, it's going to be a finite set of possible signals that the player can observe, extra stuff that he observes about the game. And there's going to be a probability distribution over the signal profiles of the player that uh, uh, each player is going to have in his mind. You know, in this case, I'm writing it in ex ante terms. So before the, the signals are drawn, this is the beliefs that the players have um, uh, about what the signal profile might be. We're allowing them to be different. Okay. Oh, sorry. We're going to maintain a full support assumption, which is that we're going to say under this prior probability distribution, it is the case that every signal of every player is given, um, that each player, I, gives positive probability to each of his own signals. That's what this says. Okay? This is the probability he gives to his signal SI and any other signal. If we sum across his signals, we'll call that phi I of SI as the notation, and that must be more than Okay. Okay. So, in doing this, we have constructed a game of incomplete information. Sort of degenerate game of incomplete information, but a game of incomplete information because players have observed these extra signals. Okay. A special case, which is going to be important, is going to be the case where you um, impose the restriction that these different beliefs that the players have over the joint distributions of signals um, is we could uh, impose the restrictions that they've got to be the same across players. Okay, you stand an assumption that we kind of make um, uh, all the time in, in economics and game theory. I'll discuss a little bit later. Actually, I'll discuss in my arrow lecture a little, um, my Alman lecture, my arrow lecture, sorry, my arrow lecture, I'll talk about um, uh, a little bit of the philosophy behind it. But, but, you know, it's an assumption that we make. Yeah. I'm sorry? Uh, it's a tiny bit with, with loss of generality. Um, the issue is that if there were signal, is that once I do, once I describe the result, um, I will, the important, why it's important is if you don't have the common prior. Okay, so in that case, it's important that there's some uh, restriction on players having the same, um, the same set of signals that they think possible. There's actually a paper by Brandenburger and Deckel where some of this rational, rationalizability stuff that I'm going to talk about, where they do um, something related. This is, you do need this in some sense for what they do. They do something related, but you need some version of this. All right. Um, all right. So cool. This is adding a correlating device, kind of a standard thing to do. I, I'm going to, as a matter of language, sort of think about it as adding information, information that happens to be payoff irrelevant in this case. Okay? So we've constructed an information game, a kind of degenerate one. Um, in an incomplete information game, a strategy changes. Now, a strategy is a function of stuff that you know, in this case, your signals. So a pure strategy will now be a mapping from sets of signals to, um, for player I, of the actions that you play, and the uh, definition, the completely standard definition of equilibrium in the incomplete information game generated by adding this um, expansion or correlating device, the definition of Bayes-Nash equilibrium. This is an interim definition of Nash equilibrium, conditional on your signal. The definition is that if you are, if you're player I and you're a particular type SI, if you followed your equilibrium strategy, this is the utility that you would get, 
given SI, under your prior belief, you would have some belief over the signals uh, of other people, um, and then your utility would be, um, uh, and then the actions would be as determined by these strategies. This would be your utility uh, if you played according to this putative equilibrium strategy, beta i. Okay, but you would also, when you're type SI, have the option in Bayes-Nash equilibrium of choosing an action when you're type SI, which is different from under the strategy profile, AI, and, uh, and then you would get this utility and you don't want to do it, so that's Bayes-Nash equilibrium. Okay? Yeah. So under the, the, common, the common prior assumption, we're back to correlated equilibrium? Absolutely, yeah. So, okay, so a, um, uh, a uh, classic observation, this is kind of, uh, you can give it different interpretations. I can think of this as a stripped down version of what um, Alman's 1987 correlated equilibrium paper said. Uh, um, we can say that a distribution over actions is a correlated equilibrium if and only if I can come up with some expansion, okay, that expansion that I just described, remember an expansion consisted of a description, a specification for each agent i equals 1 to n of a, a set of signals that they might observe and a probability distribution over signal profiles. I said this is a common prior expansion, so it's going to be uh, the same distribution phi across players. And we want to say, um, uh, Yes, it is a correlated equilibrium, only if we can come up with some common prior expansion, an A Bayes Nash equilibrium, uh, such that if they play according to beta, the joint distribution over actions generated is a correlated equilibrium. Okay? Yep? It is with, with that loss, yeah. Yeah, we could write things a little differently. Yeah. All right. The interpretation that I'm giving it right now is that some extra information that is available to the players, it is a correlating device that they observe. It, it's going to play exactly the role of the mediator that I just described. I'm giving it a slightly different interpretation, which is that it's not that there's some external player who's making action recommendations to them. It's that there's some signal that they observe coming from an exogenous correlating device. But you'll, this says that there's not a lot of difference between the two, but, you know. Okay, and this is not going to be a mathematically deep theorem. Okay, uh, like I said, we're going to be discussing extension, so let's get the logic straight. Okay, so the basic, uh, the basic point here is straightforward. It's just saying that to the extent that you have, it's like, as, as uh, Ben was hinting actually, it's like a revelation principle uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the context of playing a game, okay? So we're saying, okay, suppose it was the case that we started out with a probability distribution that was a correlated equilibrium, okay? If I want to show that there is an expansion such that you're playing a Bayes-Nash equilibrium of that game that generates that distribution, very easy, set the set of signals equal to the actions, is like a revelation principle, um, do that for each player um, and let the probability distribution uh, over signals be exactly the distribution uh, sigma over actions that we started with. But we've identified signals with actions, okay? So now we can consider the strategy profile in this constructed incomplete information game where you just uh, set your action equal to your signal, but remember, Actions have been identified with signals. And this is going to be an equilibrium exactly if it induces sigma. Well, it's going to induce sigma because, uh, uh, sorry, it does induce sigma um, exactly because they're basically both the same distribution. We set phi equal to sigma. Okay. Very easy. No, no real content there. It's going to be just a tiny bit of content going in the other direction. Uh, so how's that going to go? We're going to say, consider an expansion of um, uh, an arbitrary common prior 
expansion of the underlying game and a Bayes-Nash equilibrium of that expanded game and suppose that it does uh, induce sigma, I want to show that sigma is a correlated equilibrium, well, we can write down the equilibrium conditions for beta in the expanded game. Okay, I'm going to find it useful to write down the uh, ex-ante version of those equilibrium conditions. Okay, I wrote down the interim one before. Now think about the ex-ante version, where we say, before I've observed my signal, is it the case that I want to follow the strategy beta i? Okay, so this says, so now we're taking the um, expectation over all signals, but I can write this as um, the probability that, that player i is type si times the conditional probability. Okay, so obviously this is just the ex-ante probability. Uh, so this is his expected utility ex ante before he's observed his signal if everybody follows that strategy profile. Okay, and now we could imagine him deviating. Deviating how? Deviating by choosing a different strategy, call it beta i prime, in the incomplete information game. So a strategy specifying for each uh, signal, what action do you choose? Okay, that's what we're saying here. Okay, because you're choosing beta i prime instead of beta i. But, and here's the, uh, um, uh, but now we can say what is the ex ante utility that you are getting uh, um, uh, under this strategy profile? Okay, well, we can just rearrange it and just say instead of taking the summation over signals, we can take the summation over actions, uh, ui of ai a minus i, and then we can take the sum over the, so this is just um, changing the order of summation. Uh, take uh, maximize over, um, you know, if we fix the action profile, then we can sum over the probability of signal profiles under which, under these strategy, prof under these uh, strategy profiles beta at signal profile s, we play action profile a. Okay, so this is just changing the order of summation. But now, if we define sigma a i a minus i to be um, this expression here, okay, so the ex ante probability that you observe signals where under the incomplete information game you are choosing action profile AI, okay, then I can write it this way. Okay, and this looks familiar. That's what we had in the um, original equilibrium. This is your utility if you follow the mediator's recommendation in the original game. Okay, and indeed, This was the ex-ante utility, um, uh, like if you followed the mediator's recommendation, but you, um, if we had gone through and said if you disobeyed the recommendation, what would you get? Well, this is your ex-ante utility from following the recommendation. Now, with this ex-ante perspective, what is it that you could do? Uh, what you could do as player I is you could uh, um, choose a different action. When you're told to choose one action, you could choose a different action. Okay, that this will be the critical uh, deviations, okay? Um, and so this would be an ex-ante description of the um, incentive constraint for player I, okay? But if we give an interim version of that condition, so just uh, um, taking out sigma AI from both these expressions, we'll get an interim version of the condition, which is just the original version for correlated equilibrium. So yes? Oh, that's an equality. I'm so, I apologize. <coughs> okay, here's one. Um, I said neither of these things had a lot of content. Um, the tiny bit of content that's going on in the second bit is that kind of what we're doing is, is we're saying we have a bunch of equilibrium conditions, interim equilibrium conditions, one for each player, uh, you know, one for each signal, SI, there's an equilibrium condition, kind of the content uh, of this argument, it's saying that we can add up those interim incentive constraints, those constraints that say you have to be behaving optimally for each signal. We can add them up, so in a certain sense we're slackening the constraints, but if there's a bunch of constraints um, holding for each signal SI, we can sum together the constraints corresponding to uh, signals at which the same action AI is being played and um, uh, 
uh, that's not going to change the, the, the program. If the constraints were being um, satisfied for each signal, they're automatically going to be satisfied when we add up those signals. Okay, so that's correlated equilibrium. Okay, there's an analogous informational robustness result for rationalizability. Precisely parallel, okay? So I'm, I'm interested in the parallel ne parallelness for purposes of this talk. Okay, so the precisely parallel statement is that if action AI is rationalizable, uh, well, it's going to be rationalizable if and only if there is some expansion. Now we're not going to impose the common prior assumption. There's some expansion without the common prior assumption. Uh, and a Bayes Nash equilibrium beta of the expanded game, okay, so exactly <coughs> parallel to what we had before, but dropping the common prior assumption, uh, such that instead of saying that we induce the distribution, what I now want to say is that if action AI is rationalizable, there is some signal SI at which action AI is being played in this Bayes Nash equilibrium. Okay? Why is it? Uh, why is it appealing? Well, one can rephrase this statement as the statement that um, rationalizability is the implication of common knowledge of rationality, which seems kind of interesting. Uh, and you know, basically, just a change in words is going to say we're looking on a type space where um, uh, everywhere it's optimal. Um, to play according to the strategy, so it's, yeah, so it is the implications of common knowledge of rationality, and we can rephrase this event as saying, if there is a common knowledge event where everybody is always playing a best response, then this is saying, that's the implication of that. Each one can have his way of expanding the game. Uh, and that's important because if you simply say, what are the implications of common knowledge of rationality, there's nothing that's imposing uh, the common prior. What, what is the meaning of common knowledge in this context, in which there's no unique <coughs> universal state space, which has its own beliefs? All right. Another topic that I'm going to talk about in my hour lecture. Um, Here's what I'm doing today. Let me just back off a second. Here's what I'm doing today. Today, I'm just giving you these narrow interpretations of these two classic results that say, take the complete information game, ask what happens if you just impose the uh, equilibrium assumption of Bayes Nash equilibrium when you've observed this extra information. Um, Vasiliki sent me off on a little bit of a tangent where she said, what's the justification for this solution concept? Okay. That's not what I'm talking about today. If I wanted to talk about that, I would have to write down a different formalism. I would have to formally define what common knowledge of rational rationality uh, is. I, I might want to embed it in the universal type space, but I'm really not doing it here. I'm right now, for purposes of this talk, I'm interested in rationalizability. If you simply take Bayes-Nash equilibrium as given as a solution concept, and ask what could happen if you observe this payoff irrelevant information. Okay, so narrow interpretation, narrower justification. <coughs> All right. All right, so this is the exactly analogous um, uh, observation. Let's go through that argument. So here's what the argument would be. Suppose that an action AI is rationalizable for player I. Let's consider the expansion uh, with the property. This is going to exactly parallel the, the correlated equilibrium proof. So we're going to just consider a degenerate kind of expansion. The degenerate expansion is going to be where we identify the set of signals of Mr. J with the set of actions that are, in fact, rationalizable for player J. Now we have to define the player, a, the player I specific correlating device, 
okay, well, the property that I want to impose is that the belief that, that uh, agent J has when he observes signal AJ, the probability distribution that he has over the signal profiles of the other guys, okay, we're identifying signals with actions now, remember, with a subset of actions, and I want this belief over the actions of other players to be exactly a belief that rationalizes action AJ. What do I mean by rationalizes it? I mean a probability distribution over other players' actions, such an other players' actions A minus J, such that AJ is the best response. Okay? And then we're going to consider the strategy profile. We've identified signals with actions. So we'll look at the strategy profile where you basically, um, if your signal is AJ, you choose action AJ. Okay? And this is going to be an equilibrium by construction. Okay, you always have the belief that exactly rationalizes your play because that's how we define the non-common prior expansion. So we've constructed an equilibrium here, an expansion and an equilibrium here. Okay? So that, but that means in particular that beta i of ai, if I had fit some particular player in some particular action, we have made sure that action ai is being played by s at some signal, which is what we, um, what our theorem here said we needed to, to do. Okay, so that's the one direction. The other direction, take an arbitrary expansion and a Bayes-Nash equilibrium of that expansion, um, and take any action AI that's played uh, at any signal for Mr. I. Okay, just take some arbitrary action that's played by some arbitrary player in that Bayes-Nash equilibrium. Okay, I want to show that that action is rationalizable. Okay, how could I do that? Well, I could say, let's write AJ hat for the range of beta J. What does that mean? It means we're looking at all actions that are played after any signal by player J. Okay? So that's this definition here. Any action of player J that gets played by some SJ. Okay? Clearly, any action AJ in AJ hat, any action that's played by some type in the support, um, is going to be a best response to some belief over the um, uh, uh, actions that are being played by other players. Okay, that's a property of Bayes-Nash equilibrium. There must be some belief floating around such that it's a best response. Okay, so, but if it's the case that every action of player J in AJ hat is a best response to some belief over a minus j hat, uh, then if I do this iterated deletion process that I described, then this set aj hat for each player is always going to be there. It's always going to be there at every round k. So, uh, um, uh, so that being the case, uh, we're going to have this inclusion. So the original ai that we started with um, is going to be rationalized. Yes. You talked about rationalizability in terms of iterated deletion of strategies that are measured as responses, but yeah. since there's correlation here, you could have done that. You could have done iteration for uh, strategies that are not expected. Um, exactly. I guess for your purposes, the best response Precisely. Well, it's both easier and it's what I'm going to care about for the extensions that I'm going to do. Yeah, so, so famous equivalence between saying an action is never a best response and the action being strictly dominated. Okay, so maybe we more often hear that an action that survives iterated deletion of strictly dominated strategies captures common knowledge of rationality. But that, that's only true. It's only true with correlation, absolutely. So I have the same answer about correlation. So correlation is important both because it gives you this equivalence and because it's what's going to matter for where I'm going. Yep. The, the connection that Eric was talking about is that there's an equivalence between saying an action is never a best response. There is no conjecture that will explain why you would take this action. That is actually equivalent to saying 
that an action is, um, uh, is not strictly dominated, and in that case, it's important that you say, buy a mixed strategy. There's a duality argument that lies behind those things, and it is strict domination with respect to a mixed strategy that crops up when you do that duality argument. Yep? If you add the comma prior assumption, you get a subset of the rationality of the strategies. What is that subset? Uh, it's the subset. I don't know. So it's... Uh, th they're in different worlds, by the way. So, uh, you know, the correlated equilibrium was a distribution over actions. Rationalizability was a... Um, a profile of actions, um, but uh, but yes, of course, you're in a correlated equilibrium. You're only going to be playing actions which survive, uh, which are rationalizable. And we could um, uh, um, come up with a theory over which actions could be played in a correlated equilibrium, which I haven't gone into here. But there are further um, characterizations of that. It can be the same set if the game is a famous example, which actually is going to crop up in my talk today, is if the game is supermodular or a game of um, strategic complementarities, then um, so I want to choose a higher action if I think other people are choosing a higher action. In that case, if you do iterated deletion of strictly dominated strategies, there's going to be in a largest and, you know, this is assuming an order structure on actions, there's going to be a largest and smallest action profile that survive, it's going to be a Nash equilibrium for everybody to play the highest rationalizable action or to play the lowest rationalizable action, and that is a correlated equilibrium. So that would be an example where they're essentially the same. That's going to be, there's going to be an example of that today. There's going to be implications for robust implementation when we get to mechanism design uh, tomorrow. Okay. So this is uh, some uh, basic uh, stuff that should be part of everybody's, uh, every well-educated um, economist uh, uh, toolkit. And, and this has come up in this discussion. I've given you some very narrow interpretations of these results, and we could do lots of other things. We could introduce a formal, you know, in terms of interpretation, we could talk about, I mean, people have talked about implications of common knowledge of rationality, we could look at the connection between strictly dominated strategies. This is some stripped down version of some basic results. Okay? So I'm not really interested in complete information games for purposes of um, robust implementation. Okay? So you can rationalizability is a superset of the correlated equilibria or Correct. Slightly more precisely, the set of rationalizable actions for each player is a superset of the set of actions that might be played with positive probability in some correlated equilibrium. Okay, so what I really want to talk about today, none of this is very interesting in the concepts of implementation. I mean, Eric talked in his first lecture about implementation in Nash equilibrium. Uh, incidentally, if you had talked about implementation under rationalizability, full implementation under rationalizability, you get essentially the same answer. Okay, so in that sense, I don't care about this for purposes of uh, uh, robust, informationally robust uh, mechanism design. Uh, I care about it because I'm interested in the extensions to incomplete information. Okay, so let's do an extension to uh, uh, incom incomplete information. And I'm gonna do this in two steps. We could do it one step at a time, by the way, but then I said this was taxonomy and there would be even more things that we would have to be dealing with. So, but there are two, I want to highlight that there are two steps here. Okay, the first step is that we could take that original environment and I could add in some uncertainty. Okay, so I could say, suppose there are some additional states of the world. Uh, there are some states of the world theta um, and, and there's uncertainty about which state what might be the true state that's determining payoffs, okay? And a game now will be a teeny bit more complicated. It'll still be the case that for each player there's a set of actions, but now the utility functions of players will have to be made contingent on this new state of the world. Okay, so this is adding uncertainty. If I want to add uh, incomplete information, I want to allow players to be differently informed 
okay, then we will also want to add information about the uh, states, payoff relevant states theta. Okay? Well, we can model that with a type space as a standard kind of way of modeling that. I don't want to, again, this common prior assumption is going to be an issue for me. We can assume it or not assume it. So let's not assume it for a second. So we could say that for each player i, there's a finite set of types, uh, capital T i, um, uh, but also, and, but, and each player i, T i is just like an index set. Um, uh, but we're also going to want to have a belief, pi i, which is going to say for each type of player i, we're going to associate a belief over the types of others, T minus i, and the payoff relevant states of the world. So this language famously allows you to embed um, all possible beliefs and higher order beliefs. You know, any information structure that you want, I'll sign you towards us. Okay. And again, as I said, the common prior assumption is going to be an interesting uh, special case. Uh, so the common prior assumption would say, well, look, suppose it's the case that there's actually a true probability distribution over payoff relevant states theta and uh, profiles of types, and then this interim beliefs are just generated by Bayes' rule. Okay, I haven't written down the formula for Bayes' rule, but that would just be saying that this interim belief is simply the updating for player i conditional on knowing his own type ti. Okay, so this is a change to the game. Okay, and I'm going to tell you some stuff about what happens if we do exercises that are analogous to these two classical exercises that I described or reviewed for you in this richer setting. Okay? So we'll have an expansion of the game. Okay? We're going to be adding information for a second. Well, here's what the expansions I'm going to analyze. Okay? For each player i, we're going to have a finite set of possible signals si, same as before. Here's a little bit more complicated. We're going to say agent I is going to have some uh, beliefs about how these signals are generated. Okay? What's that going to consist of? Well, it's going to say, suppose the true payoff relevant state was theta. Suppose the type profile was T. Okay? So this is, you know, we're going to interpret the type space as saying, what's the initial information that players have? And what happens if we give them more information and in an expansion? So now we're going to look at a probability distribution over signal profiles for the players uh, given the type profile and the payoff element state there. Now notice that if we went back to the complete information case, there would be no payoff element state, there would be no information that players had about the payoff element state. So this would be exactly the same object. Okay? So it reduces back to our earlier setting. Okay? We actually need something analogous to the full support condition that we had before. Let me not go into the details. I can tell you, you know, basically just saying that there's some agreement about which signals could arise for a player conditional on any type that he has. Okay? So the expanded game is another game of incomplete information. Okay? It's going to be a bigger game of incomplete information because players will both have this original type TI that they knew before, and in the expansion, they've gotten another signal. But strategies will now be a function of your original type and your new signal. Okay? We could write down a definition of Bayes-Nash equilibrium on this expanded incomplete information game. I'm not going to do so because it would just be very tedious. Okay? It's kind of immediate what it is. Okay, so we can do exercises that are analogous to what we did before. Let me just uh, mention some of them, as I warned you, in uh, a few of them. Okay, uh, here's a benchmark that I'm going to care about: uh, belief-free rationalizability. Let's call it. Okay, uh, in words, here's what I want to talk about: a version of rationalizability for this uh, setting. Suppose that what we're going to do is we're going to do a, you know, an analogous procedure. Now we're going to keep track of the rationalizable actions um, by type, okay? which 
actions are rationalizable is going to depend on what your type is in, in this incomplete information game. Okay, and what we're going to do at each round is we're going to um, say that an action survives to the kth, the k plus once round, I guess we're saying here. Okay, if we've defined it up to the kth round, we're doing induction here, it survives to the k plus once round for type ti of Mr. i. Okay, if it's the case that it's a best response to some conjecture, assigning, uh, and, and, but there are going to be some restrictions on the conjecture, but the conjectures, you know, the belief that you have over, the, over everything, the types of the other players, the payoff relevant state, the signals that they observed, you're going to have some big conjecture. I'm going to impose a couple of restrictions on that conjecture. Uh, I want it to be the case that you're only going to put positive probability on action type pairs. It has to be the case that every action type pair of any other player J is assigned positive probability only if you have not already deleted that action as a possibility for that type of player J. Okay, so the usual thing with rationalizability. Okay, is a slightly more subtle thing. I'm going to uh, insist that your conjecture that we're using to rationalize your action, I'm going to insist that that conjecture also put zero probability on profiles of states, these thetas, and other players' types, that's T minus I. Uh, you're going to put zero probability on them if in player I's mind, so for this type, this player that we're talking about, if in his mind this is a combination that was impossible before the expansion, it's not going to become possible. Okay, that's what this. This is just a This is a definition of a solution concept. So, but this is a a uh, restriction that we're going to impose. Okay. This, on, on what space exactly? this is a solution concept on the original. On the original on the original space without the expansion. Analogous to what we did with complete information, right? Exactly analogous. Okay, so this is just a proposed, this is just a solution concept. Okay, a striking feature, I'm gonna write it down formally, but in words, this is it. A striking feature of this solution concept is that actually, although we wrote down this type space, if you think about it, this definition uh, doesn't actually use your beliefs per se, it actually just uses which profiles of uh, types and payoff relevant states do you think possible? Okay. And the intuition here, I'm, I am going to give it this informational robustness foundation. Okay. And the intuition here is going to be that um, it's going to be the case that when, when we do give an informational robust foundation, signals that you observe are not new information is not going to be able to make you assign probability positive probability to things that you didn't assign positive probability to before. Okay, that's a feature of standard Bayesian learning is you don't, you, you uh, collapse the support, you don't increase the support. Okay, here's a formal statement. Uh, uh, so we're going to say, we're going to look at the set of belief-free rationalizable actions for Mr. I at the zeroth round, we'll have all actions for him. Okay, at round uh, k plus one, we're going to ask which ones are going to survive. Well, we're going to want that to be a conjecture. Now on this complicated object, okay, action profiles, type profiles, yes, type profiles and payoff relevant states, we're going to require what? These are the conditions that I said in words before. Let's start at the bottom. Action AI has to be a best response given this conjecture, okay, that's what this condition says, we have to assign, uh, if I assign zero positive probability to any um, profile of actions, types, and payoff relevant states, it had better be the case that those actions um, were not deleted at round K for any uh, uh, type of any other player, okay? And this slightly more subtle one that I mentioned is it's going to be the case that you, um, if I assign positive probability to um, T minus I theta under this conjecture, okay, so this is integrating out the action, the belief that you have about the actions of the player. If you look at the marginal on T minus I and theta, the support of that marginal is the same 
as the original support that you had. Okay? That's why I definitely. Because it doesn't have any beliefs in it. It well, supports. It's rationalizability. It's rationalizability. Well, I, I mean, I'll give you some more. Uh, well, I'll give you an alternative definition of rationalizability that you could take to be, actually, I'll give you the definition of rationalizability that is taken to be the canonical definition. Okay. okay. I thought this was the one. <laughs> okay. okay. I haven't seen this before, actually. So, um, good. So, uh, so that's the definition. Okay, it's belief-free rationalizable if it survives. When you've got infinite rounds, everything's still finite, so this is going to be well-defined. All right. And we have an informational robustness foundation. Okay, this one. It's belief-free rationalizable for type TI. It, it says exactly the same thing, right? It's just, so as Elkanan says, it sounds like the uh, simple generalization. Is there an expansion and a Bayes-Nash equilibrium of the expanded game with the property that uh, now we've got this TI floating around, but such that the action is played given some signal in this expansion and also TI because belief-free rationalizability is defined for type TI. Okay? I promised you, and I will fulfill my promise, of not going through formal proofs later on since we understand so well the simple case, the, ba the benchmark case that we can... Um, talk in words through how the argument is going to change. Now, there's one subtlety here. Well, here's the, the less trivial part here is going to be constructing the expansion that's going to rationalize any action that's being played. Okay, so uh, um, uh, what are we going to be doing here? Well, we're going to say, look, suppose some action is belief-free rationalizable, then we know from this definition that if I do this iterated deletion, the iterated deletion is going to end somewhere, and therefore versions of these properties are going to be true, you know, when I replace this with the infinite deletion here, basically. Okay? So th those three properties are going to survive. So um, I will be able to find a conjecture that um, rationalizes the action of the best response. That was a property that was part of the definition of belief-free rationalizability. Okay, then we'll be able to construct a signal space, SI, such that if I look at a pair, TI, SI, um, you can make him play the belief-free, um, uh, I'm sorry, where it is the case that um, the action, uh, you know, because of property one, the support assumption, we can construct a signal space where only... Um, uh, actions of the other player that are belief-free, rationalizable are played, okay, I can build that property in, which is going to allow me to do the expansion. Okay? And um, the, the, uh, I want to be able to get any belief as a constraint. In the expansion, I have to be able to get any uh, new I that satisfies these conditions by Bayes updating using these signals. Okay, but if you think about it, if I'm not imposing any common prior assumption and I start out with some belief on some support, I can construct a signal that will generate any posterior belief with that support or with some subset of that support. Okay, so that's why we end up with just this support condition because I have non-common priors, I can shrink it any way that I like. Okay? So that's it. Okay? So we did complete information. We did a benchmark in complete information result, which you might think of as the most basic extension. Now, but now we could think about doing other things. We could do a common prior variation. Um, here's another, well, another variation would be we allowed you to do any expansion. Well, you might think the right generalization is to add a correlating device that gives not payoff relevant information. That's something else that we could do. And we could put some extra restrictions on the type space. So this is what we're going to do. 
Okay? Uh, one thing is imposing the common prior assumption. Okay? Well, Ben actually told you about this a couple of uh, uh, in a lecture on Friday. Okay? So here's the common prior analog, the exact analog of what we did going from rationalizability to correlated equilibrium in the complete information case. Let's do the exact analog in this incomplete information version that I've described. Okay? So hopefully this will give you some background for where that thing that Ben talked about is coming from. Okay? So what I want to do here, I just want to write down the analogous definition of correlated equilibrium with incomplete information to what I had with um, um, complete information. Okay, so we're now looking at a, uh, it's called, this is what we, um, good. So think of a decision rule, think of a mediator who is as a function of the type profile and the uh, payoff relevant states of the world is choosing a probability distribution over action. So let's think of the mediator interpretation. He's making some recommendation. And we want to say that a player who knows only his type and the recommended action has no incentive to deviate. Okay? Well, we can write down that definition. Okay? Now, Why doesn't the other eye depend also, also on the type of the player? It should do. Thank you very much. It's a, another type of. Sorry, I seem to have lots of deviate, lots of mistakes here. Um, so yeah, your deviations can depend on AI and TI, definitely. And then the co correct statement down here is what? It's going to say, no, 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 sorry. This is saying that you get a recommendation. Sigma is the recommendation that the mediator is giving you. So that doesn't depend on your deviation. He gives you some recommendation. And then you can follow the recommendation or not. Okay, so this should have AI and TI here. Okay? And we can give a informational robustness foundation, and this is what it is. I'm going to keep my promise, not go through arguments. Okay? But the exactly analogous statement is that a decision rule is a Bayes correlated equilibrium if and only if we can find a common prior expansion such that um, it induces the right distribution. Okay, and actually, Ben went through an argument for that. Okay, but it's the exactly analogous statement. Okay, and remember, Ben was talking about some, some, uh, some game theory and some mechanism design where the motivation was exactly that you're saying the common prior is satisfied. Can I say what would happen for any uh, information structure? Okay, so for any information that players might observe, well, this is going to be the answer to that question. In the context of... Uh, auction example that he talked about, in that case, the, the initial information was degenerate. There were no initial types TI. We were just saying conditional on the payoff relevant state, which was the common value, what could happen. Okay, but that's, that's this type of exercise. Here's another restriction that we might impose. we might make the requirement that this expansion uh, is actually a correlating device uh, and not giving you new sub substantive information about the world. Okay, so, so one way of saying that is we did our complete information result and we said, okay, what is the correct generalization to incomplete information? Well, it's not entirely obvious. Okay, I could say that I'll give you extra information these signals, SI, they certainly could be correlated like they were before, but they can also give you information about um, theta, you know? So they can be giving you new information about the state of the world. That's what we just, that's what we just did. That is a generalization of the complete information result. But you might think not the right generalization of the complete information result, because what you might think is the right generalization is that, look, we had, in the complete information, we had correlating devices, 
So let's look at correlating devices in the incomplete information game that, um, that do not give you new information about types and states of the world. Okay? So that's a restriction. Okay? It's going to be a restriction on the expansion. So I could say, look, let's impose the restriction that when I look at this expansion, uh, let's say that it's belief invariant. I'm not going to look at any old expansion. I'm going to look at something that's belief invariant that says, look, if I'm Mr. I, and in my mind there's a joint distribution over the signals as a function of the type profile and theta, if I ask myself, well, let, look, let's look at the distribution over uh, my signals, forget about everybody else's signals, suppose we just look at the distribution over my signals, we might impose the requirement that the distribution of these signals is independent of t minus i and theta. Okay, what, what is that assumption imposing? Okay, well, it's imposing the assumption that um, uh, you don't learn anything from your signal si. Okay, it's, n it's noise. It's a Blackwell garbling of your original information. I'm giving you additional signals, but it's not helping you. So it's not giving you any more substantive information about the world. Might be correlated with other people's signals. Okay? So it maintains the idea of correlation, but it excludes the idea of learning more about states of the world. Okay? That's what I just said. Okay? So maybe that's the right generalization. Okay? Well, we can do the same sort of exercise. Okay, the, the definition that you would end up getting with, getting up, ending up with, is interim correlated rationalizability, where we say, let's do this iterated deletion. We want to make sure that at each round, an action can be rationalized by a conjecture. I want the conjecture to put um, uh, zero probability on actions that have been deleted for some type. And, but I'm going to require that the conjecture has to uh, maintain the same beliefs about t minus i and theta, the types of others in the state of the world. Okay? So our formal statement is we could look at the interim correlated rationalizable action, start out with set AI. That's why you call the first one belief Right. So this, you keep the beliefs floating around. It's by, com right. it's by comparison with this one. Okay? And it's exactly analogous. Um, this, this is all the same. This is a typo. This should be ICR, interim correlated rationalizability. Um, and uh, it's exactly analogous. You have a conjecture. You are choosing a best response to that conjecture. But instead of having the support condition, we require that the marginal on types of others in theta is exactly the marginal you had before. And I think this is more usually used as the incomplete information version. Okay. And then we have our um, informational robustness statement here. Okay. Um, okay. Another way of saying it is that if you have belief invariance, another way of saying it is that when you get an action recommendation, uh, uh, it is the case that the action that you're playing supplies no additional information to you about the types of others in the state. All right. Okay. Taxonomy. So we can do a taxonomy. Okay. So just uh, I like taxonomies, but you know. So, uh, but just if you want a picture in your mind, we've said that I can impose the common prior assumption or not compose, impose the common prior assumption. I can restrict your expansion to be um, uh, uh, to satisfy belief invariance, meaning it captures a correlation, but not. Um, pay off relevant information, or I could not impose it, okay? And we started out with belief-free rationalizability, and we said if you impose the common prior, you get this. If you impose um, belief invariance, you got this. We could have looked at another box, you get that, okay? Uh, what's relevant? Hmm? What is belief invariance. So this property that the expansion is just a correlation device. 
Okay, one last thing I want to talk about, which is going to be important for um, our mechanism design. Uh, I just gave you results for an arbitrary um, type space, right? Uh, we had an arbitrary type space. Turns out that for some uh, Im implementation results, actually, and in particular for the implementation results that I'm going to talk about tomorrow, we're going to be working with some type space. Players are going to have some prior information about the state of the world of their own, but it's going to have a particular structure. So it's an interesting structure, special case, I think. So, so um, the last thing I'm going to do today is just see how the stuff that I talked about so far maps into a certain special case. Okay, here's what the certain special case is. Suppose it's the case that um, your payoff relevant state um, is actually a product set uh, consisting of things that are payoff relevant uh, for each player. Okay, so um, uh, so we had n players, so there's a theta i for each player, and we're going to look at, we could do the exercise that we did when it had that particular structure. Okay, when we do mechanism design, theta i might be your valuation of the object. Okay, or it might be in the generalizations that Eric described in his second lecture, it might be, there might be interdependent values, but you have your own uh, thing that you've observed that appears in your interdependent utility function. Okay, so that's a special case. We could analyze this special case um, and consider the particular type space where um, player i knows his own payoff type theta i. Okay, I know my private value, for example. Okay, and we might consider a type space where you know nothing else. Okay, you know your payoff type, you don't have any other signal. Okay, and you don't know other players' payoff types, which I could think of as saying that you have, maybe you have some belief over other players' payoff types, but there's no restriction on the, uh, uh, sorry, let's say that you assign positive, strictly positive probability, but impose no other restrictions on your beliefs, so just a full support assumption for your beliefs about other players' types. Okay? Uh, I'm going to allow you to, I'm going to state results today and tomorrow that hold true for all type spaces. So heuristically, it could include the type space where they allow for any beliefs at all about the types of others. So that would be a natural type space to look for. Okay, I said heuristically because I'm doing stuff with finite types today, but that's sort of a technicality. You could include arbitrary belief. And in particular, we're allowing for the possibility, uh, I mean, importantly, we're allowing for the possibility that you know your payoff type theta i, but you have lots and lots of different beliefs associated with each theta i. Okay? Okay, so belief-free rationalizability is going to translate into this case, and I'm going to care how it translates, so I'm going to tell you how it translates. Okay? I'm not going to do it quite formally, because we'd get bogged down in lots of notation, I feel. So let me just say heuristically what's going to happen. Okay? If I look at this special type space, okay, turns out that all I'm going to have to keep track of in terms of your types is all that I'm going to have to keep track of to characterize belief-free rationalizability is for each payoff type. What's the set of things that are rationalizable for, for that payoff type theta i? Okay? It's true that if I had different beliefs associated with it as well, with it as well, we could get different um, actions being belief-free rationalizable depending on your belief. But what I really want to keep track of is just what are the actions that are rationalizable for a given type at theta i. Okay, so there's going to be a process here where what we're going to do now is we're going to iterate, uh, iteratively delete actions for a player such that for that payoff type, we're going to look at actions associated with a payoff type, it cannot be rationalized by some conjecture over the actions and payoff types of others, 
Okay, that puts zero probability on already deleted actions for any payoff types of others. Okay, so the formal iterative construction now. I warned you about the taxonomy, okay? So uh, the translation of belief-free rationalizability in this context is going to say, okay, for each theta i, we'll start out with all actions. At each round, we're going to... Um, uh, the actions that survive, there'll be some conjecture over actions and payoff types of others, such that you don't put positive weight on actions that have survived, and it's a best response. It's not actually, it's not. which is going to be a little bit important so for me. Is it less general? Is it, it is less general, okay, and this is important, and it's going to come up why it's important. It's less general. One way of seeing why it's less general is that it's saying if you take the player, the player's information together you look at the join of the player's information, it captures everything that is payoff relevant. So that's one way of seeing that it is with loss of generality to focus on this case. But can't you just, if there's residual uncertainty, can't you just expect that out? Or is that, or is the problem that different people will expect it out different ways? That is a problem, definitely. Um, Uh, okay. Okay, so I'm going to conclude by giving an example, an example that, as I promised, is going to segue into talking about robust implementation next time. Okay? So, and by the way, we could give more examples here, obviously. Um, these example, this example is chosen specifically to, to provide this segue. Okay, and, and it's restricted to the payoff type case because of that. So let's think of a game where players have some uh, payoff types uh, in some bounded interval. And suppose they're going to choose some actions in some bounded interval. Okay? And suppose that each player has a best response, okay? writing the best response slightly informally here, you have the best response where agent I wants to set his action equal to his payoff type, other things being equal, if it was the case that everybody else was setting their actions equal to the payoff type, he would like to set his action equal to his payoff type. Okay, but this says that if other people, for some reason, were choosing actions that were above their payoff type, he would want to choose an action that is below his payoff type. Okay, so think of that being a benchmark equilibrium where you choose you set your action equal to your payoff type, but you um, adjust um, uh, if other people are not playing in that way. Okay, so this is an example where you do care about other people's payoff types, as it turns out. Okay, so this is again we're constraining our actions to be in zero one. So subject, this is your best response subject to it being in the interval zero one. Otherwise, you'll um, you're going to want to go to the boundary. If this is above one, you, you want to set it equal to one if this guy is above one and set it to zero if this guy is below zero. Okay? That's a best response. There are a zillion different ways, lots and lots of different payoff functions that I could write down that would have this linear best response. Okay? One that's going to uh, be of a little bit of interest to me is this one. Okay? We don't, we don't need to parse this one. Okay? But it's some quadratic payoff function, uh, uh, V. And we could look at the game where each player uh, has an identical payoff function, so a common interest game. Okay? And if you do the first order conditions, you know, it's not too surprising that you get a linear best response function. Okay? This is going to be important to me because it's going to say, actually, whatever payoff function you're looking at that generates this best response it's going to be a potential game. Okay? So the best response could have come from a um, uh, common interest game. Yep? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a typo. This, this audience is good, but oh well, maybe there are lots of typos I didn't see, but yeah. <laughs> okay, that's a typo, sorry. It should be no square. All right. Uh, so let's analyze belief free rationalizability and um, uh, base correlated equilibrium in this example. Okay. Uh, <coughs> suppose that. Um, you know, we've noticed that there's an equilibrium where everybody sets their actions equal to their payoff type. That's, that's clearly an equilibrium. Okay, towards um, analyzing belief-free rationalizability, let's ask the question, if you're player I and you're convinced that other people um, are going to choose actions that are within some bound, some constant C of their payoff types, okay, so they could be doing something different but not too different, uh, what can we say about his behavior under that best response function? Okay, well, if we look at the payoff function, we can see that if I have a bound on how big these numbers are going to be, then that's going to put a bound on how different my best response could be from reporting my payoff type. Okay, how big is that bound going to be? Well, we're summing uh, gamma times, and then for each other player, there's going to be this bound C on how much they could deviate. Okay, so that's going to mean that you would have to choose an action that was within the absolute value of gamma times n minus 1 for the other players times C. Okay? So now we could do this iterated deletion exercise in the payoff type space that I described. And what would we discover? Okay, well, we would discover that initially the set of rationalizable actions for type, uh, payoff type theta i would be the interval, you know, would be all actions. You could do anything that you wanted, okay? But if we looked at what happened with uh, k rounds of deletion of, uh, you know, actions that are not best responses under this criterion, I claim you're going to get this interval here. Yep? I'm sorry? I'm sorry. Yes, that should be a max and that should be a min. Okay, so this is just saying, so suppose the mins and the maxes for a second. This would just be saying that if we, uh, uh, that the initial difference, the initial size of the actions that you could be taking away from your payoff type theta i, that could be at most one because we, uh, we restricted actions to be in the interval 0, 1, okay? So that means, via this observation, that at each round, it would have to be the case that um, you would be multiplying by gamma n minus 1, the absolute value of gamma times n minus 1 each time, so the amount that you could be misreporting your type would be bounded by gamma, absolute value of gamma times n minus 1 to the k if we keep going for k rounds. And in fact, that's an argument that the um, belief-free rationalizable actions have to be within this interval. But in fact, you can show that it's actually going to be exactly this interval. Okay? Okay, so obviously that means that if this number here, absolute value gamma n minus 1, is less than 1, then we're going to have a unique... Um, belief-free rationalizable action because we're going to keep deleting until there's nothing left. Uh, but if the gamma, the extent, of the uh, absolute value of how much you care about other people, if that is above this threshold at 1 over n minus 1, then you're never going to do any deletion at all and any action could be... Um, Yes. Okay. Not doing well, sorry. I'll, I'll correct them um, before I post. Right, that was a statement that this should be absolute value of gamma times n minus 1. I need some brackets here. <coughs> All right, so that's belief-free rationalizability. Uh, 
Let's talk about Bayes' correlated equilibrium. Well, let's look at this bullet point first. If gamma is less than or equal to zero, relating back to someone's earlier question, if gamma is less than or equal to zero, we have strategic complementarities. Okay, that's saying if other people actually, so actually if other people report up, you want to report up as well. Okay, um, so it's a game of strategic complementarities. And I made the argument that if it's a game of strategic complementarities, if you iteratively delete actions the, in order to support an action as being a best response, um, what matters is going to be the highest, in order to, yes, in order to rationalize the highest thing that you can rationalize, you rationalize it by a belief that puts probability one on um, other guys taking the highest possible rationalizable action. But that's a fixed point under a game of strategic complementarities. Everybody choosing the highest possible rationalizable action is an equilibrium. Okay? So that has the immediate implication okay, that if gamma is in fact negative, so it's a game of strategic complementarities, then base correlated equilibrium is going to exactly coincide with belief-free rationalizability. So there will be a unique base correlated equilibrium if the absolute value of gamma is less than one over n minus one, and um, there will be uh, multiple base correlated equilibrium. And in fact, there'll be a base correlated equilibrium where everybody always chooses the highest action one and everybody always chooses the highest action zero. If, um, sorry, gamma, this may be confusing, if gamma is less than or equal to zero and the absolute value is greater than this, so that's saying, gamma is less than or equal to minus 1 over n minus 1, okay? In fact, one can show, and I'm not going to go through this argument, uh, I said that this game was a potential uh, game, which is to say whatever the um, payoff function that gave rise to that best response is, you could have derived that behavior from um, a common interest game, which is the definition of a potential game, okay? And in fact, this um, uh, potential game turns out to be strictly concave, that payoff function is strictly concave, if gamma is in this interval here, okay? And there's an argument um, of uh, Neyman, how do you say it? Abraham? Abraham? Abraham Neyman. Um, I just don't know how to pronounce it, I know the name. Uh, Abraham Neyman that proves in the context of complete information games, but there's an analogous result here that says that there will in fact be a unique equilibrium if um, there's a strictly concave potential function. So that, that says that if you have strategic substitutes, there actually is going to be a gap between belief-free rationalizability and um, Bayes' correlated equilibrium. Okay. So that's what I wanted to tell you. So uh, uh, next time we'll see that this game corresponds to a full implementation problem. <clears throat> Any questions?